So you guys have learned a lot this weekend. And I really believe, again, part of this is patients can be knowledgeable. They can participate. This will be a, a common thing throughout this. So we're going to walk through. We actually have our training wheels. They're up on the stage and me as well. Um, we're going to try to manage some patients in the clinic as well. So we will use your knowledge of autoimmune hepatitis and liver disease to work through a few patients. We're going to review some AIH management strategies loosely, but also then consider other important liver surveillance strategies amongst patients with cirrhosis. And, and don't forget, you are on call. This is the full doctor experience <laughs> with, without the pay. Sorry. I know. Well, doc, Dr. Season, Dr. Weinberg will give donations, I'm sure. So. So let's start with our first case. We had a 20-year-old Caucasian female, and I, I purposely put hard medical terms in here, so uh, we, we may stop on a few of them, because you're the doctor. Your office for evaluation of abnormal liver tests and feeling warm during her, uh, the past few weeks. She had a urinary tract infection eight weeks ago, but otherwise her, her pediatric doctor said that she is just, uh, she's always been healthy and no issues whatsoever. Uh, she's a sophomore at Indiana University, and she just decided to rush a sorority. So what, what kind of things do you want to know? I'm, and, and again, you don't have to give me answers, but again, one of the other things you can at your table even discuss this, and there may be points that we want to do a little bit deeper dive. In terms of her presentation, we see her in the clinic, and she says she's been feeling more run down the past five weeks. Uh, school's been really busy, though. Um, on top of that, there's a lot of functions going on at her sorority house. She's not sleeping well. At night, her forearms are really itchy. It keeps her up, and it's driving her boyfriend crazy. Her new sisters are very jealous. They want to know how she keeps that awesome tan. <laughs> so two weeks ago, she, you know, she had seen her, her primary care doctor and had labs done. And as you can see, her AST, ALT, are elevated. ULN means upper limit normal. Her total bilirubin was 1.1 and her alkaline phosphatase or AP was 150. They also uh, just sent a TSH for fun and that's normal. That doctor also got an ultrasound. On that ultrasound um, it, it describes diffusely echogenic liver, slightly enlarged. The liver is smooth though. Doppler, which is a way that we look at blood vessels, say that the liver vessels are patent or wide open. And the radiologist takes it a step further and says, gee, this is really consistent with fatty infiltration and or hepatic inflammation. So I may toss it to our stage quickly. Guys, in terms of words that we see on ultrasound and, and, and in considerations, are there things here that you look for as a physician? Um, Particularly in this case, maybe. So it's good. Her liver vessels, liver vessels are patent, so she doesn't have a portal vein thrombosis. That's something that could cause the sort of symptoms that she may be having. Um, this, the, the last sentence, findings are consistent with fatty infiltration and or hepatic inflammation. It's the way of the radiologist saying, I don't know what's going on here. So <laughs> as a patient, I, you shouldn't read that much into it because as doctors, we don't either. The radiologist has never met you and, or met, <laughs> met this patient. So they don't know what's going on. But they say, oh, this may be consistent with this. But often it causes more alarm with patients than is necessary. So I would be fine if the ultrasound had just stopped with the first two sentences. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. I think we typically I'll focus further on their descriptions, but by no means is it the end of the story. So if this would lead to more questions and more investigation, this is not the end. That's right. So great. So, and we continued our work up. Her urinary tract infection symptoms got better uh, since treatment. Uh, her doctor had given her a medication. Of course, she had no idea what it was called. Does that ring true in here? Um, but but usually the patients can say, well, it was a little white pill. <laughs> and I'll say, I, I have no idea. You'd be surprised. We have no idea what medication even looks like. She took it for seven days, though. Uh, she's been drinking, too, because, you know, she's at the sorority. She's rushing, so this is a lot of fun. Uh, she's binging most days of the week um, and up to 10 drinks in a night. It's a little surprising. Uh, so remember you're on call. So in, in the... <clears throat> And the interesting thing, I, I want you to watch Dr. Assis and Dr. Weinberg. It's Pavlovian. They will watch for their pocket, for their 
for their pagers if they hear the sound. Yeah. So Dina, who is actually my nurse and calls me often like this, and she says, there's this, this woman. She's 45 years old. She has autoimmune hepatitis and cirrhosis. She woke up this morning feeling nauseated, and she just threw up a big batch of bright red blood. And she now feels better. She had an upper endoscopy last year that showed no varices. She wants to know what to do. I don't know. What, what do you guys think? Thank you. I get this call all the time. ER. Okay, bright red blood, vomiting. Guys, anything else to add to that? ER. Okay, thank you. So back to our patient. She reveals in an attempt to look best for Rush. She's also been on a weight loss regimen. Uh, really the past four weeks, she thought she could jumpstart this. So she uh, Amazon primed it. She got a product with guaranteed results in one to two weeks. She states it must be working because she's actually lost 23 pounds this month. What, what thoughts about that are you are concerned about? Everyone seems shocked or... What's, what was that? Say that again. Supplement. So let's, let's open the topic for supplement. Let's, let's throw it to our expert panel. Your guys' take on supplements. They're very commonly used. <laughs> <laughs> and in clinic, it comes up all the time, as we can all imagine. You know, um, I don't think it's typically helpful. Um, and in some cases, it can be hurtful meaning that the liver can react in a bad way. There are multiple examples of impurities because these are not regulated products, but also of true, um, the actual compound causing injury, and that can be detrimental. Certainly, if a patient of mine has a chronic liver condition and there's a risk of an added stress, I don't think that's very, um, you know, a good, good thing to do. I never, I'm not a very, very strict person to say that you must stop all these or you're out of this clinic. I mean, that's not how it works, right? But the point is that I just, I, I'm flexible in the sense of somebody's already taking something and everything is very calm. I'm, I'm okay with that, but I also caution that there's not a lot of evidence and probably a lot of money can go into this without a lot of results. I think those are good points. And I also want to pick Dr. Vupalanchi's brain. Dr. Vupalanchi's coming up next, but he's also an expert in drug-induced liver injury. Thanks, Craig. Um, we are part of Drug Induced Liver Injury Network. It's a network of um, academic institutions across the United States in uh, um, collaboration with FDA and NIH. So over the years, we've observed that the number of cases with liver injury from herbal and dietary supplements has been going up. Uh, we don't know if it is because more people are using it or it is because we are recognizing it better nowadays. Um, but currently it's estimated from our data that 20% of liver failure cases that we see are related to herbal and dietary supplements. Um, number one cause that we see is um, weight loss products, uh, especially young women. Um, the common ingredient that we believe is uh, green tea extract. Um, green tea has been around for ages and um, um, it's been um, linked to several positive benefits to health. But a green tea extract capsule has around 1,000 cups of green tea in it. So imagine uh, revving up the system um, over time um, and having unanticipated uh, consequences. So we've had uh, women undergo liver transplantation from liver failure related to green tea extract. Um, another thing in young men that we see are anabolic steroids, especially young families uh, or who are going for a police uh, academy. They, they want to get fit, increase muscle mass. And those are the situations where we see jaundiced young men, very concerned wife, crying because bilirubin is 40, doesn't need a liver transplant. And thankfully, in those cases, even though it's very dramatic, they don't go on to develop uh, uh, liver failure with liver transplant. But uh, we always worry about uh, green tea extract. Thank you. So she gives you a little bit more history. Her mom has had lupus. Um, she also 
uh, did some other bad stuff. She exper experimented with IV drugs at a party last month. Yeah, so it's a little bit complex. I don't Craig, how many liver diseases do you want to give her? <laughs> this is worst case scenario, right? <laughs> so remember her labs two weeks ago. Here are her labs today in your office. We see a pretty marked increase in her AST and ALT. Uh, again, quite high, to over 10 times upper limit normal. Her bilirubin is now 2.1. And her INR is 1.2. Let's skip that for a second. Her exam, again, this is medical jargon. But again, I want to see, you see what we write in our notes. She has a, a flat affect. She doesn't, she doesn't really bounce around a lot. She's appropriate, though. Her sclera are ictric, meaning the whites of her eyes are yellow. There is no lymphadenopathy in her neck, uh, armpits, or groin. We feel a liver edge. It's about a centimeter below her costal margin or her rib. Uh, we feel tenderness to pushing with it with light palpation. She is, uh, her, her extremities are thin and warm. Her skin, you can see these excoriations, which are scratches down her arms. In her neurologic exam, uh, there is no asterixis. Um, does anybody know the word asterixis? So someone that knows it, what is it? I, I see someone demonstrating. You want to show everybody? Yeah, so in terms of now, there's an, an idea that if asterisks can come from a number of different things, but liver disease is one of them. So an you know, inability to clear some certain pieces of metabolites that affect the brain and it's obeyed it to establish position sense. Uh, but we see a normal kind of, or not a normal, abnormal flap. And it's kind of an indication that liver, particularly in this case, could be getting worse, but not seeing it as a good thing. Differential. So would anybody have picked viral? So IV drug use, someone said, so I think that's good. What kind of viral? What does that even mean? So hep C, what else? How about hep A, hep B, hep E? Okay, all those. Drug-induced liver injury. Dr. Vupalanchi kind of hit this on the head um, regarding one or supplement, but what about our antibiotic? Yeah, so we didn't know what the antibiotic was, but again, it's important to know the antibiotics are probably one of the number one causes of drug-induced liver injury that we give patients. Um, same thing we've talked about here is drug-induced autoimmune hepatitis as well. We're going to skip this a little bit, the deeper dive. Other infectious pieces, Epstein-Barr, we see in young women, uh, maybe HSV, which is herpes, simplex, and other. Um, how about alcohol-related liver disease? Is binge drinking enough in a short period enough to, to cause elevation liver tests, fatty liver, all these things that we're seeing? Yeah, possibly. And then other. Guys, any other thoughts we're missing? <laughs> Wilson. Wilson. Wilson's is, is perfect. So acute Wilson's uh, would be a consideration. This would be a copper problem with the liver, but again, a, a great thought. I, I wouldn't start up the Wilson's workup until you'd ruled out all the other things first. All right, good. I think that's great. So question for you guys. Does she need to be hospitalized? Why? Because everything's elevated? Okay. So you want me to commit her? So you should lock you her up. <laughs> okay. okay. Let's ask our experts. So do, do we think we need to admit a patient like this? What's your thoughts? It's a good question. I think uh, she needs to be worked up very quickly. Sometimes when this comes up in real time and you're trying to wonder how quickly you can put a evaluation and treatment together, you know, the, sometimes you need to admit to do that very rapidly. Sometimes you're on the verge or on the fence. If you have the availability of getting, well, we'll talk about when next, next, let's say a biopsy within the next day or two and labs can be checked every few days, you can try to bridge that, I would say, from my standpoint. But that's not always practical, not always possible, or the patient feels worse, and so you have to navigate that gray zone a little so bit. So I'll often call a patient with these labs, and I'll say, I think I probably should admit you. Possibly, we can get things something done, and they say, hell no, I'm not going to the hospital. <laughs> um, and that's just the case it is, and say, well, you're guaranteeing me you're going to the lab, we're getting uh, biopsy or whatever else that we need to do. Um, so let's, let's look at things. So here are her labs. Um, Uh-oh. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. So even, even these guys miss this. Um, remember the boyfriend? It was, yeah. okay. 
Yeah, and the binge drinking. Oh, yeah. It was. So, guys, what, what does a pregnancy test make you worried about? Oh, they're not paying. Dr. Vupalanchi, any thoughts on pregnancy test? So there, there, are, there is pregnancy-induced liver disease, particularly, in, right? So we have to think about this. The thing was, is at least these labs are high enough that probably not thinking hyperemesis gravidarum, which is something we see, but you have to think about, um, despite all of her other risk factors as well. Um, her last period was eight weeks ago. Um, the other thing is because when you're pregnant and your risk for HSV, this is, this is something that's significant and cause a liver failure type of picture. Um, the good thing is, though, her, her herpes testing, her PCR, which is how we detect HSV in the blood, was negative. So it's at least reassuring. Uh, everything else, we do these acute viral serologies, like did she just get hep A or hep B recently, are negative. So that's at least reassuring. And we sent her autoimmune markers as well, and her anti-smooth muscle was high, uh, 1 to 80. ANA was positive, and her immunoglobulin panel was 1,600, so a little bit abnormal. Oh, no. They didn't flinch, though. I don't, yeah, okay. So 16, uh, my, my nurse calls again. Um, so a, a male, he, he's on uh, azathioprine. He's leaving for Scotland, and unfortunately, this is somewhat of a true story, but I don't know if it was AIH, but he, he just read a book on scotch, um, of course. He's anxious to try some local batches. This is kind of what was highlighted to me. So can he? No. Why not? What's the general consensus? Are we allowed to drink or not? Why no? Okay, it depends. I heard it depends. So let's look at the literature for this, because I think this is an important question. And it's really two questions. Does it have, one, any impact on progression, and one, any impact on onset? There's really few studies, surprise, surprise. So alcohol is a risk factor, a trigger. Uh, probably the best, which is very small, looked at alcohol. And I presented this yesterday morning. But it actually was independently associated with the reduced risk of developing autoimmune hepatitis. Again, small study. The other thing is then progression. That's really the big question for this room. Uh, 1,300 Danish patients looked at risk of death. Alcohol use was looked at in this model. They didn't quantitate it very well at all. Again, a yes, no for alcohol is not a great look at whether you're drinking or not. It's a huge range. And we saw the patients that had history of alcohol use were two and a half times more likely to have a bad outcome. That was transplant or death than those that do not drink. So let's throw it to our experts. Come on, Dr. Weinberg, I just want one little drink. I, uh, I want one drink. I, I actually How would you counsel me? I think <clears throat> unless, unless uh, someone has alcohol-related liver disease, alcohol in moderation isn't necessarily going to cause further damage. And that's, the key word is moderation, though. So that depends on each patient. So that's my cop-out of saying a few drinks here and there. What I usually tell patients is special occasions is not going to be such an issue. But, you know, if you're drinking uh, to the point where you meet the NIAA um, definition for excessive drinking, which is two drinks for women daily or three drinks for men, that is a problem whether you have autoimmune hepatitis or not. What we don't know is wh what is the safe level of alcohol, if any, in patients with pre-existing liver disease that's not... Uh, alcohol-related liver disease, and the answer is I don't know, but a small amount is probably okay. Is that starkly different than anybody else and what they're told at home? Does everybody say no to, uh, who, whose doctor says no to drinking? So I think this is there. Now, one of the considerations, though, is cirrhosis or not, an impaired function. That may be a very different question. So that's a, that's a discussion to be had locally. So we had the biopsy, and this is what it looked like. And we've seen some pictures of biopsies. We're not going to walk through it. But the differential includes autoimmune, drug-induced, and or viral. This is what the pathologist kicks back to my office. And dang it, did they move? There you go, okay. So 45-year-old female with known AIH and cirrhosis, she, she woke up and feel nauseated. We, we wanted to kind of get a follow-up on this. This is Bill Kessler. He just scoped her and sees this. And it, it looks like a... What, what is that? Yeah, so that's a bleeding esophageal varicy. Uh, this as an endoscopist is like your worst nightmare. Um, fortunately, Dr. Kessler is a hero, and he banded, that's what a banded varix looks like. He actually is able to suck up that vessel into a clear cap and put a rubber band along its base to stop the bleeding. So let's talk about varices. In fact, in, in patients with cirrhosis, we're talking about patients with advanced liver disease. 
New varices can develop at a rate, it's variable, but eight, five to eight percent per year. And really, at three years, it's around 30 percent. So small varices, though, so if you find that you have varices, they actually will get bigger in size at a rate of about eight to 12 percent in a year and 30 percent at three years. So one of the reasons we bring this up is if, if you're cirrhotic, and there are some different guidelines on this, but again, the question is, do you need an upper endoscopy for screening within some of those intervals as well? Um, there's been a little bit of a change, particularly some of the Bovino classification, you know, particularly looking at liver stiffness and platelet counts, but again, I, I want to provide it for food for thought. So how would you treat her? So I think I came to the uh, conclusion that we thought that this was autoimmune hepatitis. Just based on the general consensus, we ruled out a lot of things. The most likely, the best likely diagnosis is AIH, and you're at AIH conference. <laughs> so doctors, uh, prednisone or budesonide? Uh, for a patient who has rising liver enzymes and is uncomfortable, I, in my personal experience, it takes longer to get to remission with budesonide, so I wouldn't yeah. mess around with budesonide in this short period. I would yep. think about that later if needed, but I would definitely go with prednisone. I think that's a great insight, and again, it, it, there's kind of a threshold of like, okay, time is now, time is everything, let's do steroids. I think it's, you know, prednisone is a systemic steroid. Uh, budesonide, again, I paint the picture of this as kind of a topical agent to the liver, um, we can talk more about that, but again, when you're not going to mess around, steroid is probably the key. Uh, when do we start other immunosuppressants? When someone's liver tests are elevated. When they start going down? Okay. Guys, what do you do? When do you start others? Well, it's never an easy answer, of course, <laughs> but if in this case... Maybe, I don't know where this case is going actually, but um, <laughs> if I suspect a drug or a, a medication that could have triggered this, I'm a little less eager to start azathioprine. I try to treat with steroids alone and see if we can wean off because if it's triggered by something else, usually we can get to remission without a relapse. So I'm, personally, I'm not so eager to have two or three medications if we can do with one. Um, but assuming this turns out to be, or this would be in real life, an actual clear-cut case of just autoimmune hepatitis, I typically start azathioprine along with a prednisone. Now, of course, we have this pregnancy to figure out, of course. Sure. So I, I, we're not going to go much beyond this so it doesn't get more complex, so you're, you're off the hook a little bit. I would say that we still don't actually know whether this is... Um truly AIH or drug-induced AIH, so I would probably stick with the prednisone for at least a few months on its own, I even if she wasn't, even if the pregnancy wasn't there. Yep, no, I think that's a, a, that's a, that's a great point. We're going to skip some of these other pieces because I do want to get to the next case specifically and all this great interaction. We have a 54-year-old woman who, who comes to our office and she's had abnormal liver tests for this past year. Uh, she's always been heavy. But she's had increasing weight since uh, the first of her three pregnancies when she was 21. She currently is 200 pounds and her BMI is 39. She's been seeing a primary care doctor for five years. Uh, at the first visit, he told her, you definitely have fatty liver disease. Uh, she was supposed to lose weight, but much like all of us, she just gained another 25. And we got paged again. I'm sorry. We <laughs> CT calls and says that we have a patient that uh, they just did a CT, uh, you, you ordered liver cancer surveillance. And they see this three centimeter right liver mass with early arterial enhancement and delayed portal venous washout. So this is characteristic of hepatocellular cancer. I bring this up primarily because how do we screen patients with cirrhosis? Um, there's a number of different ways and, and really what is it related to AIH and what, does that change risk? There was a meta-analysis that just looked at this recently. It was 11 studies. Uh, the risk of liver cancer over the course of the patient follow-up was anywhere between 0.2% and up to 12.3%. Uh, proportion of these patients that developed cancer without cirrhosis was reassuringly very small. A study we did here at Indiana University, we actually saw also the duration of disease may be an important risk factor for this, um, as well as the gender, as well as the race. So... Guys, how do you follow for liver, briefly, about liver cancer screening in cirrhotic patients? What, what approach do you take? So ideally, I would get an MRI every six months. So we're able to detect cancer earlier, uh, at earlier stages, and we can get a better characteristic of it. Uh, CAT scans can be helpful if there's a contraindication to getting MRI, but often the insurance companies are limiting us to more and more so just getting ultrasounds and only 
doing either a CT scan or an ultrasound if there's a, a CT scan or an MRI if there's a concerning finding in ultrasound. This is problematic because some of the early cancers are not diagnosed on an ultrasound. So this is something I'm constantly fighting insurance companies with, and I'm sure you guys, the, yeah. the liver doctors are probably nodding. Right yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything yeah, else? Great. Okay. So let's skip through that. Um, she's been, uh, let's follow up with this. So no symptoms except occasional right upper quadrant discomfort, uh, some right knee pain. Uh, she doesn't drink. There's no new medications. She's a little bit easier. Um, and, and she definitely can't get pregnant. We know that. She, she. Liver tests, chronically elevated AST and ALT. I'm going to target you there. And you see that these labs have been consistent for the past two years. Um, other medical history, uh, she has the kind of full kit and caboodle with metabolic syndrome, diabetes, hypertension. Um, she's overweight, anxiety, but also depressive disorder as well. Um, she's got a mom with cirrhosis, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, and she, she said she wasn't drinking, but maybe she's drinking periodically. Um, this is her medication list. Again, a pretty common medication list here in North America. Um, and she does take naproxen periodically for pain, but she stopped a few months ago. So differential. Um, do you guys have a general gestalt? I just painted a picture of metabolic syndrome. She's been told she's had fatty liver disease. She has really the whole piece that kind of fits together. It, I mean, this seems like a slam dunk, right? It should just be fatty liver disease. So we're a little bit more diligent. She came to an academic center, so we're, we're going to give her what she paid for. So we do the autoimmune panel, and we see positive autoimmune markers, particularly that asthma or anti-smooth muscle antibody, and her IgG is elevated. Um, we won't get too deep into the iron stuff. So. How does that kind of consider this? It, it, these, these autoimmune markers, we've talked about specificity and sensitivity a little bit. But in fact, Dr. Vupalanchi was part of a study here that looked at anti-smooth muscle positive results in patients with NASH or fatty liver disease. And we see it in about 10% of patients. So sometimes it can be a little bit confusing. Same thing goes too with IgG. We may see this elevated in a small percentage of patients with fatty liver disease as well. There were some other thoughts, but we got to still think, could she, in fact, have some chronic smoldering AIH on top of all of this? Um, and if you look at the simple criteria for AIH diagnosis, the point of even bringing this up is, again, a NASH patient may fulfill all these criteria. So sometimes it's down to where we say tissue is the issue. So we do the liver biopsy. And really the key parts here are some of those clear uh, areas on the liver biopsy, if I can target with my pointer, if it will work right there. So the pathologist was impressed, and it's, it's not a real great picture, but there was significant amount of fat, but also the inflammation that he saw was consistent with autoimmune hepatitis. And in fact, there was inflammation related to the fat as well. So it's created this idea of autoimmune hepatitis NASH, or fatty liver disease, overlap. And this is probably somewhat of a, a, a variant syndrome. There is one paper that has looked at this. Um, this is uh, out of, I think, Vermont, if I remember correctly, right, Burlington? So 14% of patients with AIH had fat on their biopsy, uh, and another 16% had NASH, too. The interesting thing, though, is the patients with the NASH piece on top of were more likely to progress in terms of fibrosis over follow-up. Um, they also had an increased risk for liver-related death compared to just plain old run-of-the-mill AIH. So they're a little bit more exciting. So how would you treat her? Maybe we'll ask our experts. Are, you, are we seeing a lot of AIH NASH? Are you guys? It's more and more common as a diagnostic question for sure. You know, we have internal data that we're working up now that we don't necessarily see in our, in our center that the, the risk of progression is, is as high as was reported in that paper, but we're looking at it very, very carefully. I do change my treatment regimen. We can talk about that based on the paper. So, I mean, I'm, with, with diabetes, being very overweight, I'm even more keen to avoid or at least minimize steroids. So I, I'm, I would probably give a higher dose of azathioprine than usual, and I'll try to get by with a minimal dose of steroids, perhaps even steroid-free, just azathioprine. I've done that a few times. Sure. Because what we don't want to do, of course, is worsen the fatty liver by worsening the diabetes and all of those problems by any extra steroid. But it's a, it's a fine line. Great. Guys, thank you. And so in terms of conclusions, cue the Dr. House music. Uh, you guys have passed. This is great. But, you know, patients present with numerous variables, and, and really a lot of steps go into diagnosing you. This is not a one-stop shop, full swoop, one visit. It's often multiple. And so it is a process, just to remind you. Patient knowledge, uh, 
there's data that says that this improves outcomes, more satisfaction with care, and actually reduce healthcare costs. So again, you guys here are doing great work for the economy, which is great. And you can be an active participant. You really can be. You guys don't give yourself enough credit in terms of what knowledge you can glean and take to your doctor. So I would continue to encourage you to do that and have those hard discussions. Thanks, guys.